Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Sarah and Avi for inviting me to uh, present on behalf of the, uh, the Human Lung Cell Atlas Working Group, our progress. Um, and as Avi already mentioned, uh, lung was not uh, on the radar early on. And uh, ever since the uh, October 2016 meeting, I've been uh, trying to get it on the agenda because I think lung is a great organ to work on, but that's mainly because it's my subject of research. Yeah. Um, as I said, I'm uh, talking here on behalf of the, uh, um, the Lung Cell Atlas Working Group. Uh, this is proving to be a really collaborative group, so we're really trying not to drive the field by one group making a major advance, but really by co yep. collaborating and trying to integrate data and, 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 and combine data sets from different labs, different platforms, and that comes with uh, a lot of technicalities that we'll address into some detail. Uh, so you can see here that we spend actually uh, quite a few uh, institutes and also quite a few uh, regions, which is very nice. So uh, I'll briefly go through uh, the different projects. Um, but first, I'd like to uh, introduce you uh, to the concept of why lung is actually such an interesting organ to work on. Uh, first of all, uh, lung is of vital importance. Nobody will doubt that. But it's also a very uh, com complex and complicated organ to work with. There's more than 40 cell types available. There's multiple uh, functionalities that the organ serves. Uh, and at the same time, it has a highly ordered structure. So it's, it's like this one-way road down into the parenchyme, which keeps bifurcating 23 times until you end up with uh, these very small alveolar sacs where the gas exchange occurs. So it's, you know, it's, I, like, I actually like this one very much. So it's a really it's a mathematical uh, or, uh, order that uh, the lung is formed by. So this makes thinking about the structure and then placing cells at a certain uh, point in the lung uh, actually a very uh, enjoyable enterprise. Apart from that, lung, you can actually uh, get lung tissue just from healthy subjects by bronchoscopy. So that makes obtaining a live, uh, um, or op obtaining fresh samples uh, very easy. So you can, uh, that's what we do in the lab. You can do bronchoscopy in healthy volunteers. You can get your, your samples and then you can process those. And then uh, the time between obtaining your material and having them in the lysis buffer so that you can start your cDNA synthesis is actually quite short which makes the quality of the data actually excellent. Uh, the additional advantage of lung is that there's a lot of lung resection programs all around, uh, specifically for tumors, but also for some other disorders. So there's also a lot of lung parenchyme uh, tissue where you cannot come with your uh, bronchoscope, uh, but there's a lot of that available to different labs. So this is typically one of those projects where you can actually build a community effort because a lot of labs have access to the materials and can start building their own data sets. So in the white cell paper, uh, we promised uh, ourselves something, which is that we will be aiming to sample tissue from a number of locations uh, along the airways, all down into the small airways, and then also the respiratory unit, AKA uh, the lung parenchyme. Um, in addition, and this was uh, uh, driven by the broad uh, uh, scientists that were joining us, uh, uh, they expressed their wish to process a number of uh, lungs into great detail and try to almost do uh, 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 a complete coverage of a whole lung, which is actually exactly what they're doing, so we'll get to that, uh, and which is very exciting. So in the previous meeting at uh, Weizmann, uh, Jay actually presented some of his mouse data on lung, which was very exciting, but hardly human, of course. Um, but he, um, he identified this novel subtype, which uh, Aviv also alluded to already, which is this ionocyte. Now, as a basic biologist, discovering a new cell type in a tissue that you work on is, of course, uh, very exciting. Um, so basically, the mouse data set is, is, is now there. It's these uh, seven uh, subsets of epithelial cells present in the lung, and we'll get to those uh, in the human lung as well. Um, the Broad Institute group also uh, uh, now is starting to work towards this full coverage 
of, uh, of an entire lung. So here they have like an 80,000 uh, cell data set. I didn't put all the numbers because I find, you know, counting cells is like, this is how many cells we have, it's slightly boring. Um, but at least it's a, it's a very rich data set of lung. So there's a lot of bronchioles or airway wall tissue. There's also some uh, parenchyme tissue matched from the same donor, which is very nice because you can actually do in integration there. Um, and uh, uh, we now need to think about how do we go about dissecting all these different parts of the lung that we should address to have a full coverage lung atlas into great detail. But at least we're getting there, uh, and this is a good step towards this. Um, then the lab of uh, Pascal Barbry in uh, Nice, in France, um, this lab was the one that uh, uh, obtained uh, uh, CS CSI funding for, for their uh, uh, lung project, which is great. So also the Jan Zuckerberg Foundation or initiative um, recognized the importance of lung, which was, of course, great to hear uh, uh, when we were trying to get this lung atlas working group together. And what they'll be doing is not so much uh, taking a whole lung and dissecting it into, the, into different pieces, what they will do is actually sampling with a bronchoscope, so having these very fresh samples of high quality uh, airway wall tissue at several locations along the respiratory tract. So they'll stay, start in the nasal cavity. Now, nasal cavity formally might not be entirely a lung, but it's very relevant and it's part of the respiratory tract. So I fully agree that this should be included. And then they'll go to the main bronchi, uh, somewhat deeper into the intermediate lower airways, and then also all the way down to the distal lower airways. And I'm really quite curious how far down they can get. But um, I'm not a, a pulmonologist, so I can't comment on that. Um, they also already have some data. This is nasal biopsies, where you can see that it's, it's largely epithelial cells, some endothelial cells. Again, these ionocyte-like cells are present there. And if I look at these genes, they're slightly different from what we see in the, in the bronchi, so that's something we need to look into. But there's also basal cells, serous cells, goblet cells. So this looks like a first start towards uh, the data we will be generating. So the Barbary lab will be doing this not just in nasal, but at several locations along the respiratory tract. And this will not only tell us what kind of cells are in these different locations, because we more or less think that we know that already, but also how do these epithelial cells or endothelial cells or these other uh, structural cells change along the respiratory tract, which is going to be very relevant. Uh, this is our own study, uh, uh, so we collaborate, my lab collaborates with Sarah's lab and also Herbert Schiller's lab from uh, Munich, and we have quite some, bi so we also do the biopsy of upper airway, uh, uh, so that's fifth to seventh generation airway uh, tissue, and then we have healthy as well as asthma patients in here. I know asthma patients are not supposed to be healthy, but actually what we use the asthma patients for is to help us define what is healthy. So by contrasting asthma to healthy, you can actually have a better definition of what a healthy airway wall would be like. At least that's what we think we should do. There's also a transplant lung and tissue resection for tumor lung. Uh, and this is the lung parenchyme. And we'll actually, what we try to do is try to integrate these data sets. So we, have, we don't have a crazy number of cells per lung, but we have a lot of lungs from different locations using different platforms. We do 10x, but there's also DropSeq in here. And then trying to integrate it into one data set, because this is what at some point we'll need to do to be able to build an atlas of a lung or any other organ. Uh, and we're just playing around and trying to get this done. In total, we're around 50,000 cells, so that's decent enough. Uh, this is what the cell looked like. So uh, this is the airway wall epithelial cells. This is the non-epithelial cells. You need to take them apart, otherwise your clustering doesn't really work well, because the data set is dominated by epithelial cells. Again, basal, secretory, ciliated epithelial cells were the things you would expect. And then this novel cell type ionocytes that's present in these upper airways, not so much in the parenchyme. Um, and because this is a novel cell type, we really got excited. So we looked into a little bit more detail because always when I get excited and I, you know, I share the data within my institute, I work in this, this multidisciplinary research institute, which is great, but then the pathologist says, ah, oh, it's just a neuroendocrine cell. And then, you know, I'm basically stuck because I need to convince him that it's not. So what we did is uh, we did serial sections 
And this staining here, the synaptophysin, is specific for uh, uh, neuroendocrine cells, whereas here we stain for FOXI1, which is the transcription factor specific for ionocytes, and here one of the other proton pumps expressed uh, uh, by the ionocytes. And you can actually see that these more or less stain the same cells, whereas the neuroendocrine marker stains different cells. And here, for those who are not colorblind like me, uh, you can also look at the uh, immunofluorescence picture. Um, and if I really need to convince you, I just took a little bit of that and blew it up to great proportion, so I didn't know I had the screen this big, actually. Um, uh, so here's the synaptophysin stain, the neuroendocrine cells, and you can clearly see that the FOXI1 doesn't stain these same cells, but it stains different cells. So, you know, to all the knowledge we have today, neuroendocrine cells are not the same things as ionocytes, which is great, because that really means it's a novel cell type. So then the other part what we were doing uh, within our group is that we were trying to, so we have this data set here where we combine drop seek data from lung parenchyme, 10x data, lung parenchyme, and 10x data airway wall from the biopsies. So the processing time for, for these, these different tissue sources is different, the platform on which we uh, process them is different, and the, the scientists or the technicians or the labs where we are doing this are different. So this is three locations, two platforms, two, and two uh, tissue sources. And this is just a TSE &E plot if you put it all together. And if you then ask, so where, which clusters, you know, where's my 10x data and where's my drop seek data, you know, it, the platform drives your clustering. So this does clearly doesn't work. So we then use this CCA method, or actually uh, uh, Goste Carr used this CCA method, who's a postdoc in the lab of Sarah. Um, and then after CCA correction, the uh, clustering is less platform dependent. I mean, there's still a little bit, but it's, it's already better. And then we are, so, you know, in this data set, can we still find these ionocytes, maybe also in the parenchyme, and then the ionocytes were gone. And the reason for this, the cluster of the ion sites were gone. And the reason for this is that this algorithm actually regresses out uh, the, the signals that are specific for one or a few of the samples. So we lost the specific signals from the airway wall samples. So that's, that's uh, not a very great approach. So although we like the method, we uh, actually um, we discussed it with uh, uh, Fabian yesterday, yesterday evening, into some detail. He tried to convince me that there was something better, and he tried to explain it, but I'll leave it up to him because that's not my expertise at all. Uh, but we're working on this, and I'm quite sure at some point we'll get there, and we'll be able to integrate these different data sets from different platforms and different labs into something where you can actually do an, uh, a follow-up analysis in, because that's, of course, what we want to do. Okay, so what's good about these data is, again, the data coming from different platforms and different labs. If we now look at the, at the, uh, the correlation between different clusters, so that's what we do here. So these are the different clusters in the data set. This uh, color here says you which group actually generated the data, and this is which sample uh, it was that, uh, that this cluster is in. Um, then uh, you can see that there's nice correlation in this cluster with itself, but not with the other clusters, etc. So that goes all the way down here. So this means that the, the clusters are actually quite robust, even though uh, 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 as long as you take the, the, the cells or from one uh, tissue source. So this is all parenchyme. As soon as we, we put in the airway wall tissue here, it falls apart. Then it doesn't work anymore. Um, so the, 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 the previous one uh, was a metric of correlation. Here it's just really the gene expression level, and again you can see that uh, uh, the gene expression level nicely identifies the clusters quite robustly across platforms, across labs, as long as you look at the same tissue. And that's great news. So that means that if I look at this tissue, or any of you looks at the same tissue or similar tissue, that we can actually use the same genes to call the clusters. So we should just now start naming clusters for what they are, right? So please, somebody, uh, I'm not going to do it, but I would love to use it. Right, so what are the plans? I still have two minutes, so I can, I can say this. Um, the plans are to further optimize this, this integration of data. Uh, so that really needs some attention. And of course, we'll reach out to the, uh, to the platform as well. Uh, we'll accumulate more data because now the data sets, some data sets are really rich, some data sets are rich in, in, in replicates, not so much in cells per replicate. So, you know, we need to accumulate more. 
uh, and we need to have a greater depth of sampling up across the different locations of the bronchial tree. Now we have one location into considerable depth, but the other ones are still sketchy. So we just need more data. Uh, we need to integrate spatially resolving methods. Clearly, we need to start doing that. And we want to align our data, because there's a lot of immune cells, obviously, in the lung, with the, 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 the immune cell atlas working group, because there's definitely some data there. Also with the tumor or the, uh, the cancer working group, because they also have a lot of lung data. So, you know, we need to start reaching out and interacting there. Uh, and of course, as always, we are really a collaborative group. I'm here on behalf of the whole group. It's not merely my research. Please, if you do something that you find, think is interesting, that you can contribute to the lung cell atlas, reach out. I'm a nice guy, I, you know, I, <laughs> honestly. Uh, so these are the current members, but please, uh, your name can be on this list as well. Okay? With that, uh, I'd like to uh, thank everyone in the group, also the funders. Because we're such a diverse group, we also have a very diverse number of funders that fund all our research. Um, and of course, I'd like to, to, to specifically thank all the people in the lab that, you know, there's so many of them, I can't put them on the slides, but really, they, these guys are the ones doing the work, not, you know, me or, well... Okay, Sarah's doing a lot of work. Anyway, with that, I'd like to thank you all and take questions. That was great, thank you. We've definitely got time for a couple of questions. Hi, um, Bruce Erno from I'm the NIH Lung Map Project. Um, I noticed in one of your TISNEs that you had a, quite an underrepresentation of the Asia positive type 1 cells which we've had a lot of trouble in the isolation of them into a stable state. You know, particularly the most mature type 1 cells are hard to get released from the tissue. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as opposed to the myeloid cells, which are, you know, very quickly out and, right. and happy. So, um, have you explored the, trying to stabilize the, the, the whole um, release pathway? And, and what, what is the differential representation of the cells as a function of, of um, that's a very round. good question. Yeah, so uh, that's an excellent question. So how does your, your processing of your lung material actually affect the representation of cells in, that you get in the data set? We've done some of that. We've looked into different protocols for dissociating your tissue, and depending on you know, which protocol you use, you, get, you do get a different representation. But we haven't done that. You know, that was actually in our Chen Zuckerberg initiative. But we didn't get that. Um, but you know, I think it's a great it's a great idea that should be explored into more detail. We haven't done it. We've been pragmatic. We've we found something that works well, and we've just stuck to that for the moment. But this is something that clearly needs to be addressed. Yes. Yes. About representational biases, that's also discussed at length with the white paper. Is that? Um, there are multi by applying multiple strategies, you get a much better idea. So by using spatial methods that are done in C2, you get a better, even if they're not even single cell resolution, you can get an idea on whether you're like off base in representation. And nuclei can help as well, which also work for lung. So because they are less prone, because there's, it, it's not as sensitive on cell death. Yeah. Yes. Um, for a correlation to, so the different platforms, have you tried correlating the data to bulk to gain any insight into what the bias might be? Um, we're doing that. Yeah, so we're, we're using matched, actually matched bulk and single cell. So we have the suspension where we generate single cell data. We have the bulk data on that same suspension. Uh, because of this point just raised, that depending, you know, if you just take the biopsy, then your representation might be different. So please get away from that. We're doing that. So uh, I can't give you the answer. Thank you. Thank you. How many different uh, persons, individuals, or patients have been sequenced in this project? Uh, no, I'll just. Run back. That's fine. Um, so, how many individual patients have been sequenced? So, it really depends. Uh, with the airway wall, we're now up to 18 or something like that, and we just, you know, we keep adding every every week. Um, for the lung parenchyme, it's somewhere between 10 and 15 in our data set. Uh, in Aviv's group, for instance, uh, or Jay's group, or the collaboration between the two, they have two, but they have an incredibly rich data set. I mean, they have the number of cells is incredible. Right. 
Right, so it, you know, you always have to balance a bit by number of biological replicates if you wish versus number of cells from the, the, from the match donor that you want to do. Uh, and we're actually, within the lung group, we're trying to do both, but just in different places. Okay, great, I think we've got time for one more question. Greg Gandelfinger from Montreal. Thanks very much. Great presentation. I'm, I'm very happy to make the acquaintance of new cell types every time I go to a meeting and uh, feel like I didn't study anything in life. Um, so it, it's really great to hear about the ionocytes. And I think one of the fear that some of us have when we're doing these experiments is losing a rare cell type. So um, um, without um, influencing any uh, platform choices, um, do you think that sequencing more cells at a shorter depth versus um, um, less cells more deeply would um, have allowed you to detect ionocytes more easily? Or did you have them on one platform, not the other? Yep. Um, what's your lessons learned from, from this new uh, discovery? Well, you know, my bet is as good as the next guy's. But um, I would say that you do need an, a, a minimum number of cells to be able to detect rare cells. But still, to be able to detect rare cell populations, they also need to be sufficiently different transcriptionally from the other cells, uh, or you'd gonna, you know, need much more cells. So the ionocytes are quite different uh, from, from the other epithelial cells in the transcriptional profile. So even if we do 1,500 cells in a specimen and you know, it's around 1% or even below 1%, we still accurately identify them. However, if, if the transcriptional profile would be less different from the other epithelial cells, it's much harder to identify them with these like on the low end sort of numbers per sample. So then you need to accumulate more cells. So at the end of the day, it really depends on your research question, whether you want to go for shallow sequencing of a lot of cells or, or more in-depth data like the SmartSeq2 that we also do for a smaller number of cells. Uh, you'd li actually like to have both, but you know, that just doesn't work. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you very much.